It is a good thing just to be a professor because I don't have to respect the protocol. So all I can say is that good friends. Um, I'm very happy about the governance in week 2014. It's been an extremely uh, rewarding experience. In particular, our center, which we have called GAVEN, the Center for the Study of Governance Innovation, was launched just a year ago. Um, and it went from having staff members, just me and the deputy director, to about 16 staff members at the moment. Some of them are in the room. Actually, I would like them to stand up so that we can all applaud them because they've done a job. So please, guys, why don't you raise? And, um, you don't want to raise, so I want to put our hands together for them. <laughs> Everybody, word. Gracious, John, Chris, Reason, Magali, Frank, and Eddie, Stephanie, Sonia, thank you so much. As of now, we have over 10 multi-year research projects. Less than a year, we have published over 10 research articles in internationally accredited journals. Uh, our university puts a lot of um, emphasis on that. And then reports, as well as five books. Uh, my Gross Domestic Problem and the most recent numbers of the world, I'm happy, I've sold about 7,000 copies in the past months, so, and not too bad academic books, and are now being published in Chinese and Korean. So I don't know how many of you will be able to read those editions, but just in case, a huge market. Uh, the book, The Fall of um, the ANC, that was co-authored by our deputy director, that is in the room, Kissing uh, Ovo, I'm told it's just a bestseller in South Africa with over 9,000 copies being sold only in six months. It was published in February this year. Um, those of you coming from overseas, get a copy before you you leave, it's available at the airport bookshops. The German public TV ZDF, a couple of months ago, filmed a short documentary about Gaven, which was aired in March, and a project uh, coordinated by our co-director, Ward Ansov, actually was the subject of a documentary screened by our German-French um, TV channel, um, that was just a couple of weeks ago, and was about the Land Matrix project, which we presented today. We've been invited among other things, to present our work to the Balazs Center of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ashbourne Dialogue of the German Development Corporation, GIZ, and the Degrowth Conference this year will take place in Leipzig, Germany, in September. We have just launched our seminar and paper series by the appropriate name of Rethinking Development, and today is one of our seminars. And in partnership with the Human Economy Program and the Postgraduate School for Global Development and Agriculture. What is governance innovation? That's a technical but also quite elusive term. Well, as encouraged by Susan George, one of our board members, uh, which gave this um, keynote public lecture just last when we launched the center, we have decided to take a critical stance on both governance and innovation. We understand governance not as a technical process of decision making or as a proxy of the very vague and abused, abused idea of good government. I mean, good government for whom? But we understand governance is a dynamic concept describing competing and complementary interests that shape our, how our societies function. For us, governance is a more comprehensive concept than democracy because it reminds us that, it's a, it's a, that the decisions are a combination of public and private actors' influences that our societies. Governments matter, but businesses, civil society groups, media, and the like matter as well. Um, some of these actors together, while some compete for influence. And most of the decisions that really influence how the world works are actually not shaped by elections, but by what happens between the elections. This is when the concept of innovation becomes crucial, and there are board with a lot of pressure in us to clarify the meaning of governance and innovation. Here you go. As governance opens the democratic process to a variety of competing influences, then what we have to see is the possibilities that different actors have to influence the decision-making decision process with less transparency than we think. And often the citizens, civil society, are left out as they lack the time, the resources, and the capabilities to influence governance. We see these happening all too often, also in the country. In this regard, innovative ideas and processes can help level the playing field. Through new social institutions, we can reinforce the decision-making power of citizens and the influence of collective action. This can happen at the local, national, regional, and global levels. This can be done by rethinking how we manage natural resources. 
understand the role of agriculture in society as we discussed today. It can be done by rethinking institutions that govern our food systems and so on and so forth. All these issues and many more have been occupying our debates during the Governance Innovation Week for the past few days. This week has not just been a conference, an academic exercise. Of course, we had scholars, activists, and public intellectuals exchange ideas, debate, and also disagree at times. We have also tried to innovate in how a conference is run. Uh, we, could, of course, have booked most of our, all our international scholars at the local Sheraton or Hilton hotels, and have all the events take place there. It would have been much easier, believe me. But it would, it would also have been fake. Just like many conferences are these days, people fly in and out and don't understand anything of what they are. By contrast, we decided to invest in the local community, booked five local family guest houses, and cooked the food right here asking local farmers, local brewers, local bakers, and local student workers to assist us. Uh, our university chef, Hanny, has turned all of us into a delicious culinary experience that you're getting. some of you that haven't been with us in the past few days will be able to taste that later. This Governance Innovation Week has been organized by real people, not by corporations. Please find time to speak to Hanny, our chef, about food. Chat with Linky from the guest house and Ronell, and um, the various, you know, like, and the other people that work there. Let's talk to Kim about her five-month baby that keeps her so busy, even though she has to run a busy flight schedule for the rest of us. Um, chat with Yang or Yuan on the way to or from the airport. Get to know the people who clean your rooms, that cook your breakfast. The appreciation for the human dimension of our work is something we have learned from late President Nelson Mandela, who knew the names of all cleaning staff at the presidential buildings have tea with the gardeners, although people were previously forbidden from even being seen by politicians. These are real people. It's the real economy. It's an opportunity to turn ideals of change into reality. And if the Wi-Fi at the best house is not top quality, smile. And remember that there is much more to life than continuous access to your inbox. <laughs> uh, this is... <laughs> this is Sentence that um, many people said. And of course, I know, of course, that um, Gandhi also mentioned something similar. But I only heard once from the late British politician Tony Blair. Once said, "You know, first they ignore you, then they say you're mad, then dangerous, then there is a pause, and then you can find anyone who disagrees with you." Well, this is a part of the description of how we see governance innovation. In 1998, a citizen coalition to promote a financial transaction tax, known as a tax and left, among others, by Susan, established, they were ridiculed, accused of cheap populism, considered an irrational bunch of radicals. You correct me if I'm wrong, Susan. Ten years later, the global economy crashed, and we're all living the consequences of such a catastrophe. The European Union now has agreed to establish a financial transaction tax as of January 2016. Between 60 and 80 percent of European citizens are in favor. President Barroso just said, this tax, and I quote, can raise billions of euros of much needed revenue for member states in these difficult times. This is about fairness. We need to ensure the costs of the crisis are shared by the financial sector instead of shouldered by ordinary citizens. What would the world look like? This is me, of quote. What would the world look like if such a tax had been implemented 10 years ago? Our tax friends are not crazy after all, are they? So at Darwin, we believe that we are in the verge of a historical transition. This transition may occur by disaster, that is, it will be forced on us, or by design, we bet on design. Through our research, we intend to contribute to understanding, experimenting with, and charting new ways to build a safer, healthier, fairer, and if army, it's a cheap term, but I still believe in it, a happier society. In this regard, we believe that universities have a major role to play. The word universitas comes from the concept of universal knowledge. Unfortunately, a drive towards hyper-specialization is turn most of our universities into institutions, unable to connect the dots across the disciplines and unable to, to look at today's challenges in a holistic fashion. Contemporary universities have often traded so-called excellence in outputs, ratings, you know what I'm talking about, right, for social relevance. Recent reactions among students, such as inspiring the rebellion against textbook economics that is spanning the world, recently featured also by the Financial Times are a good indication of the fact that time has come perhaps for universities to reinvent themselves. I'm told by these students, by Twitter, that my great 
domestic problems actually widely read among these schools, which makes me very proud to say. Once a friend told me that forming a university, that reforming a university is like restructuring a graveyard. You won't get much support from within. Happy to say, this doesn't seem to be the case at the University of Pretoria. We believe our university is well placed to lead the academic transition in South Africa. We need a new model of research and a knowledge generation which crosses boundaries and promotes innovative thinking. While in the past our university was associated with, rigidly, uh, with rigidity, political conservativeness, and lack of pluralism, we all know the past of the University of Pretoria, lately we have demonstrated a strong commitment to change. We may be on the verge of a critical U-turn. Through its support for innovation and transdisciplinary research, the University of Pretoria may very well become a pioneering voice among those research and, te and teaching institutions interested in leading Africa towards the, a brighter 21st century. A future Africa that we all cherish and that we can achieve by rejecting, by rejecting the idea that this continent can only develop according to models and paradigms invented elsewhere. Um, we believe in ecological design, biodiversity preservation, energy efficiency, and organic food provision in a country in which, which struggles with hunger and obesity next to one another. And as my friend Raj Patel would say, a population split between those who are starved and those who are stuffed with junk food. Our university is committed to integrating these aspects into our current facilities and structure and is currently seeking resources. As I speak, our vice chancellor is in New York trying to get money for build a dedicated institution to the advancement of transdisciplinary research for scientific innovation. At Govan, we're a transdisciplinary research team, with some of us from social sciences and others from natural and cultural sciences. We believe in re reaching across in disciplines, and we encourage systems thinking. Our challenges from climate change to endemic poverty and inequality are not discrete problems. They cannot be tackled by sectoral interventions. They require a fundamental transdisciplinary approach. Our critics may very well tell us that we're not focused enough, as we're not experts of a subsector, of a subsector, of a subsector, of a subsector, of a discipline. Point absolutely taken. The history of knowledge is paved by the contribution of non-specialists, like Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, Karl Marx, John Cain. I don't know how many of you know that actually Cain's never studied economics formally. His mother, Alfred Marshall, tried in vain convince him to study economics, but Keynes opted for mathematics and philosophy. He wasn't, obviously, he wasn't focused enough. Our Governance Innovation Week was opened by Johan Galton, another scholar with little focus. Trained as a mathematician, Galton founded peace studies and became one of the leading sociologists of the 20th century. And now it's a privilege, an honor, and above all a pleasure to welcome another intellectual that struggles with academic focus. Dr. Dana Shiva was trained as a physicist and philosopher. Her PhD dissertation dealt with hidden variables and locality in quantum theory. Vandana Shiva then founded the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology, which led to the establishment of Navdanya, which means nine seeds as well as the new gift, an international movement to protect native seeds and biodiversity and support the promotion of organic farming. More than 7,000 farmers are now members of Navdanya. She's a member of the World Future Council, along with other renowned authors like Jeremy Rifkin, and has been an advisor to the Indian, Italian, Spanish, and Sudanese governments, among many. Time magazine identified Dr. Shiva as an environmental hero in 2003. Forbes has identified her as one of the seven most powerful feminists in the world. And Asia has called her one of the five most powerful communicators of Asia. She's the author of more than 20 best-selling books on ecofeminism, organic farming, social justice, and all globalization activism. She's been the recipient of a long list of awards, including the Order of the Golden Ark by the Dutch Royal Family, the Global 500 Royal of Honor by UNEP, the Right Likelihood Award, also known as the Alternative of the Law Peace Prize, for pioneering insights into the social and environmental costs of the dominant development process, and her ability to work and for local people and communities in the articulation and implementation of alternatives gave her the Save the World and the Sydney Peace Prize. She's the promoter of what she called, I find is exciting, the Grandmother University, a research and, te and teaching institution where traditional knowledge is promoted as the real custodian of biodiversity, biological equilibrium, 
and ecosystemic as well as human well-being, well -being, which, which should all be supported and not opposed by new technologies and scientific discoveries. It is a great pleasure and honor, and I'm so excited actually to have Vandana among us.